Okay, truth time. Sometimes work's pretty boring. And other times it can be kind of, you know, unproductive. What if I told you that introducing games into the traditional workplace actually could help everybody be more engaged and, heaven forbid, more productive? Our guest today is going to talk about that very topic. And we're going to play some games at work. Hold on. Hello to you. I'm Russell. This is the podcast. What podcast? Well, you already know, but you know, I have to tell you. It's Relationships at Work, the Employee Experience and Workplace Culture podcast. I want you to think about how you go about your day, how you have meetings, how you brainstorm, how you just go about your day and try to move the needle forward at work. Well, now I want to take that and put that in a box over here for a minute. And then I want to ask you about any games you've played and really any type of games. We could be talking about Settlers of Catan. We could be talking about Ticket to Ride or Parcheesi, Connect Four, Crazy Eights. Doesn't really matter what game we're talking about. There's a lot of commonalities with these games. There are rules. There's a set objective. Some have board games in which you follow a particular path. And even when there's not a board game, you kind of know how the game looks when you're putting cards down in front of you or, or between a group of people. There's either a one sheet or, you know, 1700 pages of what journey you're going to have to go through to quote unquote, win the game, right? We all know this. We've all played some variation of a game. Now imagine taking those principles and putting them in the workplace, in one of those meetings, in one of those strategy sessions. Well, I was really excited to talk about this with our guest today. I've known Cody for years and a couple of years back, she was sort of testing out a new game with a group of us. So we all went virtually online and, and went through this whole process. It got pretty competitive pretty quickly, but you could see ideas forming. You could see us going on this journey We we were sort of individually, but then collaboratively working together. It really, it really showed me how productive you can be if you gamify the process. Ever thought about doing that at work? Well, Cody might uh, change your mind. Let's go talk to her. On the show, we have Cody McQuay. Here's why she's awesome. Yeah, there's a dramatic pause. She is a consultant and facilitator on learning experience design. I'm going to have to take a breath while I go through all these. She was strategic director of uh, for Kilman Diagnostics. She's a certified in EVI facilitation by Gamatar. What the hell's that? Well, apparently they're an edutech company focusing on gamifying learning and employee engagement. She has lots of facilitation, coaching, organizational uh, change management, scrum master. She was, oh man, I'm just, I have a, I have a list here. Acti, game-based management training. She's their North American facilitator and she's uh, one of my fancy friends. Hi, Cody. Welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. We're talking games today. So before we turned on the microphone and I pushed record, we were getting into it because of course I'm going to use all the wrong terminology because I'm learning this as you throw your intelligence at me. So gamification, gamifying, lots of words for basically incorporating gameplay into the workplace. What is that? Yeah, yeah. it's a great question. I think, I mean, I think it can be seen a couple different ways. There's, if you want to, you know, use gamification, you're usually adding badges and, you know, confetti to tasks. You know, we know it works on things like Strava, where you're like, ooh, you know, you earn that next badge and you, you do a few more laps around the block. It encourages um, me. I know it does. I, I, I will go, oh, look. It totally works. Picture. I ran around the park. Look how far I got, everybody. It totally works. And then you might think of games at work as being something like icebreakers. You know, they don't really have a lot to do with work. Maybe you build some of those like noodle towers to figure out how your teams work together. Um, but the games I'm talking about are more like, 
we're gamifying work. So we're trying to create using that game uh, dynamic. You know, there's a goal, there's a, a way to win. There's you got a little player, you have a game board and thinking about how can we use something that is um, in that suspended reality and then work like that. So it's really about how to change the way we work. So I guess the big question is why? Why would an organization look at the way they're working and their processes and their just interactions in a day? Why would they look for gamifying as something to look at? I mean, one of the, the pandemic, one of the most uh, in-demand skills right now is facilitation. The reason why we need facilitation is we need somebody to shepherd a conversation, shepherd decision making, shepherd collaboration. Because when we all, especially it's it's exaggerated on something like Zoom, we all get in a call, everybody talks, nobody can hear, so we don't get anything done. But if you think about that like a game, it's like everybody's showing up, we've all got our cards, I think we're playing crib, you think we're playing poker. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. But if you tell people ahead of time, hey, we're playing uh, bridge on Friday, they know, you know what to do. They know how they're going to show up at the game. They have a sense of how this is going to go. They sit down at the bridge table or maybe they sit down at a blackjack table. They know how to orientate themselves. So they're as they're picking up their cards, they're going to be able to pick, you know, how do I show up? How do these cards, what do they mean to me based on what I'm trying to do? So in thinking about work in terms of games, we're making the goal explicit ahead of time. And the rules. Yeah. And the rules, that's exactly, we're creating also a way like how you play. So um, that might mean we want this to be a collaborative decision-making process. So we're going to go around the table and everyone's going to throw some ideas in there. Maybe we want this to be an ideation process. So we want to make sure that we're going through a process where we're saying, what have we forgotten? How do we bring up something um, that seems counterintuitive? Maybe we're wanting to think about strategy but we're wanting to bring in some futuristic, like, you know, some of the futurist perspectives. We're saying not what are we, what do we know will be true, but what do we not know? And so now we're looking at uncertainty. So by framing what we're trying to do, not just the goal, but framing the rules around it, we create kind of a, we create that game board. So people know how, how to show up, which you know, bring, it kind of, it elevates the conversation. It elevates the kind of work that people bring, but it also levels the room. You know, if we strip it right back, it's like you've got a goal, you've got some rules, everybody knows their part. You've got to, like, when you pick up a new game, if you go to like a board game cafe, it says you can complete this this game in 30 to 60 minutes. So now you've also capped some time. People know what to expect. So you've got a sense of scope. What is the benefit? I mean, I, I certainly see the why being... Yeah. We've always done it like this. Oh, don't we always love that fucking statement? Well, we've always done it like this before. So looking at gamifying as a way to shake things up, but at the same time, get intentional, which is what yeah. you're talking about. What is the benefit to say the workplace or employees or leadership when it comes to bringing in these principles? Um, so all of those pieces help people to engage differently, but they also prevent, have you heard of the hippo problem? No, but please do. Please do tell me. <laughs> so the hippo problem happens often in meetings. We all know it well. It's the highest paid person in the room. And so they usually, you know, they present a problem and quite quickly, you know, or maybe there's a group of hippos, they, somebody presents their perspective and then everyone goes, that sounds great. And they start nodding and they start kind of going, yeah, that's perfect. Instead of what you want to tease out is how does the person on the floor feel about the way that you've changed the shelving? How does the person, you know, running the cash register feel about the way that the prices now scan? Because they're going to tell you things about your customer. They're going to tell you things about the everyday kind of nitty gritty of the way people are working that you're not going to get from that lens of the high pay, highest paid person in the room. So you start to really, in terms of leveling the room, you're starting to get a more user centered perspective, which I know is, you know, is very popular, is very buzzy user centered design. But how do we do that? How do we actually make the design like accessible and inclusive and from a, a hierarchical perspective in an organization, but also from, you know, the customer to profit perspective. Looking at the hippo problem, you're saying <laughs> yeah. that if you make the rules of the game to be more inclusive, then yeah. it has to be more inclusive because it's in the rules and you got to play by the rules. Yeah. And then there's, there's ways where you can even like 
that's where you can game it. We'll call it that. So there are these, these easy tricks that you can kind of pull into play. So if you know, you know, I'm say, let's pretend I'm a manager, I'm creating a meeting and I'm really hoping to get the feedback from my teams. Say I've got several teams on um, a strategy we're rolling out. Now, if I want to, to tease out, you know, what, um, what I, what they really think and not what they think I think and want them to say <laughs> the gap between those two, I'm, I change the rules. So maybe you give everybody time to, you know, come up with a few thoughts on their own. They write them down on a piece of paper. Now the game is you have to share them. Everybody shares them. Maybe we start with the most inexperienced person in the room. So they're not going to be afraid to share what's happening. So you've kind of created this game dynamic where, yeah, you're, you're teasing out the, the type of feedback that you're wanting, but in a way that feels safe and people understand this is what's being asked of them. So they're kind of free of feeling like, oh, you know, I, uh, I'm scared to contribute in this way, or I'm scared to participate like this. There's an opportunity here, especially, and I'm really digging the rules idea because there's how many meetings do you go to when you don't have an agenda? So you're like, why are we having this meeting? Yeah. Why do I have, do I have a role? Am I just the person in the back of the room listening or am I presenting? I have no concept of what's going on here. Am I yeah. in trouble? So at least by having rules, it's establishing expectations. So people have the confidence in what their role is, yeah. whether they are the top hat, whether they're the race car, they have a much better idea. See, I'm digging into the gamifying thing. So they have a better idea of what this monopoly or game of life that they're they're contributing to. Yeah, exactly. And I think more than that, when we think about engagement, people want to show up. They want to come prepared. They want to participate. Uh, I don't have the sense that everyone is looking at work for ways to not engage at work. I think it's that the opportunity isn't there. So if you let people know ahead of time, hey, on Thursday, we're playing bridge. Here's what you need to bring. They're going to come prepared. Or they're going to say, hey, sorry, I can't make it. So if you let people know ahead of time, like this is what is expected of the meeting. Here's the pre-work. Here's the rules to the game. Here's how it's going to go. And here's the goal. I mean, how many meetings have we gone into where you don't even know, like, what are we trying to do? What are we, what is the end goal of this meeting? No clue. And nobody seems to own it. So creating that game, you can also bring some ownership, whether it's to the person who called the meeting or everybody collectively to say, you know what? We said we were uh, aiming for this kind of a decision. We seem to be kind of off course here. You know, if we were playing cards and all of a sudden I lay down a flush in the middle of crib, someone's going to tell me like, hey, that's we're, you're playing the wrong game. We're playing a different game over here. So it kind of allows everybody to uh, participate in creating that alignment which keeps the work focused. It keeps it really streamlined. It keeps it nice and tight to the, to the goal. And I think it creates a sense of, of ownership and responsibility that everybody gets engaged with. So it's kind of like a byproduct, the engagement. <laughs> I want to get into sort of the tried and true, horribly conducted meetings. I want to get into that in a minute. But first, from a Cody perspective, why the hell do you love this stuff so much? You've been doing gaming and facilitation for years now. Um, and I know it's still very fresh for a lot of organizations to even consider this stuff. So why the hell are you so interested, Cody? Um, you're right. And I mean, I've been down many of the rabbit holes. Like, you know, I've been down the gamification rabbit hole. I've been down the game storming rabbit hole. I've been down the gamified rabbit hole. Lots of rabbit, uh, holes. Lots of rabbit holes. Um, But I think the thing that keeps me like chewing on this, the thing that I think is so exciting is that, and we know it from our non-work lives, people who like games, you get into a gig, good game and it could be a sports game. It could be, you know, you watch a good um, uh, football game. People are like, oh, what a great game. They were into it. Everyone was in sync. Like we can appreciate how that feels, even just watching it. The same thing if we're playing a board game, everyone has a lot of fun. And so it's that capacity for that suspended reality that comes with games that I think, why, why does work have to be a drudgery? Why can't it be engaging? Why can't it be something that people enjoy? Why can't we open up new ways of thinking about how we're working that allow us to feel more autonomy, more agency, more control, more creativity? Like, and then I think from that, it's like, we do better work, which is what everyone's trying to do. 
you know, we're trying to get there, but it's like, I feel like we, we go about it in ways that don't necessarily involve the person doing the work. <laughs> not wrong. Not wrong. So if I'm a decision maker, I have access yeah. to money or resources in the organization and I'm thinking, damn, I've got to bring gamifying into my organization. What problems are they trying to fix? Like what is a flag for them to go, X is a problem, gamifying might be something to look at for this. So I think, you know, there's a, I mean, it's a great question and there's a couple of kind of more superficial answers and then there's a couple of more just deeper answers. Like on a superficial level, you know, you're going to create more fun. Everybody loves fun. Everybody loves creativity. People like, you know, to feel, and they like to collaborate oftentimes people don't feel like they have the opportunity to collaborate. So when you give them novel problems, even problems about like things at work and they have the opportunity to work together, they're getting some of those social needs met and they feel like they've gotten to work with a team and they have a team. And this is a, a you know, it generally is something that really feeds people. But on a deeper level, I think what you get is you get more ownership over um, the type of work people are doing. They might own strategy. You can construct a game that's going to um, have embedded learning in it. Um, so if you want to share, you know, a new strategic position or a new way of um, approaching work, you build it into a game. You make it something fun that people can engage with. So it's kind of like it's a spoonful of sugar that makes the medicine go down. So you can you have this opportunity to engage in organizational change in a way that's um, contextualized. It's in work. It's not separate over there with noodles and marshmallows, but it's still fun. It's still fun. It's still engaging. It's easy. It's low stress. It doesn't have the the higher stakes of like, yeah, but I need to get this done next week for deadlines. It's, it's a little bit more playful, um, but you're also opening up things like creativity and engagement, different levels. You're starting to create behavioral change within the organization because people are getting to explore in low stakes ways. How do we work together? Maybe as part of the game, you add a reflection. How did that go? Did everyone talk? Did we build on ideas or did we shut them down? So now you can look at how did we play the game, not what was the game, you know, what was in the game, but how did we play it? How did we work together? Um, so I think it, cre it creates a lot more opportunities for growth, both at an individual, but also at a team level while doing work. Which is the important part. And I'm not going to just not mention that you made a Mary Poppins reference. And I'm just going to just mention that that did happen. Just acknowledging it and moving on. Okay. So all well and good. All these gamifying and playing games at work and, you know, more fun. Let's take something shitty like meetings and sort of work through a meeting. And I don't know, maybe whatever works best for your example, what kind of meeting. Um, it, it could be any, but let's, let's pick one. So say we're doing a monthly staff meeting. It's something like a monthly staff meeting generally is probably going to have an agenda because we know it's a bit higher stakes where, you know, we may not be, um, paying for the meeting, but we're paying for everyone's time. So it's higher stakes in the sense that everybody, all the staff is there. So there's going to be some kind of agenda, but it's often quite one way. So rather than it being an engaging, immersive experience for everyone participating, it's more like watching a show on TV. You watch the meeting go by, you know, the things happen, some things happen to the characters. Um, if you're like most of us, you know, you zone out or you open another window and you do, you know, your real work while you're on the meeting. It's never happened to me. You know, I know what happens to others. About. So. No idea what you're talking about. No, no. However, if we create more of an experience, so now we're going to invite people in. We're going to maybe create some kind of a framework or um, a process where we're going to say, hey, everyone dump um, your ideas here about, you know, how this process went for us or how we're, we're doing on this KPI. You know, put your thermometer rating in. Now we're having a conversation that everyone is engaged in. And I'm just talking about like, you know, there's a lot, especially with virtual facilitation, there's a lot of things where we use things like, maybe Mentimeter or some of these kind of like polling things, which are great. They're a good step, but there's nothing like, I know in a way it doesn't matter if my poll gets in there, 
But if instead of saying an hour long meeting where we all watch something, maybe you create five questions and you say, take five minutes, answer each of these questions. Now go into a breakout room with five other people. Um, talk about those questions and how they impact your work. Now come back out, share it with the group. And now we're going to get a highlight view of how these, what you just shared relates to the projects happening or the big focus for us for the next month. Now everyone sees how they were involved with what's coming next. So it's become more experiential uh, and a little less uh, one way. We talked about rules earlier. So say there, for an example, we'll keep using the staff meeting. What kind of rules have you seen that you find really useful that people would know ahead of time? Yeah, I, I think part of it is that like if you want to contextualize the games you're playing at work to work, meaning it's not a fluffy exercise. It's it's something meaningful. It's about work. You need to give people time to know to prepare. Uh, there's different types of personalities. Some people need time to reflect. Maybe you need to um, ask a team to spend 20 minutes together to synthesize one piece of feedback. And you have a representative and now every team is sharing out one piece of feedback. But now this meeting has become more of a tapestry rather than a one way discussion. So, you know, those are things sending out pre-work, telling people what the goal is. You know, what is the goal of the meeting? What are we trying to do here? We're having this meeting so that we can all align our work so that we can achieve X goal by the end of March. Oh, OK. Um, we want to know what's standing in the way for you. Then you have to have a follow-up. You have to let people know you heard them. You have to tell them how their feedback in the game is moving into real life. So you kind of got to, you know, take it from real life, move it into some suspended reality, and then take it back out. You're looking at this as a game board, sort of as moving from the beginning to, you know, do your game of life, have your two kids. I can't remember the game of life. I just remember the little pink and blue dots. It was yeah, you get a car, 1957. Get a car, yeah, you get a car. You get your ultimate job, your you house. You have to go to university. Like that isn't even a choice. You <laughs> have to go to make any money whatsoever. Yeah. Very old school. So as a facilitator, how would you prepare for playing games at a meeting? I mean, I think the big thing is um, knowing who your stakeholders are, uh, taking the time, you know, if you're designing the game board, I mean, if we think about back to that, you know, the game of life, somebody thought out that game. They came up with the rules. They drew out the game board. They um, put all the pieces in there. They thought about like the cards you get and how much money you get to start with. So that was all clear before everyone came. So the person who, I mean, I think one of the quickest things you can do as an organization, have somebody own the meeting. If you own the meeting, you run the game. And the game is happening whether anyone owns it or not. If nobody owns it, you're playing poker, I'm playing crib, you know, somebody else is playing bridge, and we got somebody else over there playing Yahtzee. We're all playing a game anyways, we just aren't playing the same game. And so if you have somebody own it, they're going to say, hey, we're all coming together, we're playing blackjack Tuesday from 11 to 12. Here's the goal, here are your cards. And so now you come prepared, you're like, I know what's happening. So I think that's that's one piece. Talking to the stakeholders and knowing what goal will make it successful for the people involved. Being able to hold those multiple perspectives because your executive leadership might have a very different goal as to what makes this meaningful than, you know, your cashier. They have totally different goals. And so sometimes I think we get that the the game of the meeting was designed with only one goal in mind, which is where they often fall short. And people say a lot of things and then we go, well, that was nice. What is the resistance to playing games at work? What have you seen being the common thread of resistance to it? I mean, I think one of the first kind of myths that needs to be thought about with this kind of approach is that it's fluffy. Because I think the only games we are used to playing at work are fluffy. You know, there's some like really awkward icebreakers that people are like, oh, God, this is so strange and I don't know what I'm doing. And or that feeling we're like, but what does this have to do with work? And there is this middle ground where we can incorporate all of those tools that make something fun and engaging and creative and innovative and safe and inclusive. But we can align it with work. You know, it takes a lot of thought. Someone has to think about it ahead of time. It's way more effort to prepare a game 
or to create a, a game board, for example, um, whether it be, you know, using frameworks on a whiteboard or preparing, you know, a mural or a mural board. Um, it takes a lot more work to do that than it does to send out an agenda invite. <laughs> Without an agenda. <laughs> Without an agenda, just to say to make the decision, but we're not talking about how to make the decision. So kind of accepting the fact that either we're doing it well or it's happening, but either way, it's like something's going on. It's, it can't be avoided and creating the rules and creating a framework and kind of a progression, the arc of the game, the arc of the meeting, the arc of the decision allows us to make sure that we're not leaving things out, that we're making deliberate and intentional decisions, which saves us rework. It saves us frustration. It saves us having to clarify. I know you've been doing this and facilitating this for a few years in different experiences. No need to name drop, but do you have any experiences that were your favorites that you were in there and you're like, this is why I do this? I was working with uh, a new team. They were a really big bank, two big banks in the States, and they had been, they'd merged. And it was um, a securities team, like a data securities team. And so we started playing some of these games. Primarily, our goal was how to build trust and how to hopefully accelerate organizational trust. And so the team had been working together. Um, we'd been meeting regularly and playing different kinds of games around communication. And when I say games, it's just like small exercises that can be, you're trying them and then you're saying, how did we do? Did we like it? Did we not like it? What did we learn? And so they were around communication, around conflict, around prioritization, basically how do we tackle work and how do we do it well? And the sort of final event was that we were coming together to play uh, a group of games uh, around building a team charter. And the team charter was how are they going to engage around their work? How are they going to engage around this merger? Because it was a huge merger. And how are they going to accelerate their team? And, you know, this was a team that had been working together, but had never met in person. So we met, we all came together. This was pre-COVID. And in one, it, I think it was in a seven hour session, you know, we got done. They were like, they stood back and all of a sudden it's like, they knew how to play bridge. They knew how to play poker. They knew how to play crib and they just went through it. But every, all of those um, behavioral changes were embedded in the way the team was instead of something they were trying to do. So they were effective. They were listening. They were solving problems. People were creative. They were sharing things. I remember at one point, the two managers stood back and they're like, this is it. Look at them go. And the team was just, it was doing it by itself. Um, but we'd, all of those other games we played built that confidence. They'd modeled the safety that, you know, people felt comfortable to take risks. They felt comfortable to push back. And so I think I was like, oh yeah, this is, this is why I do this. And in, you know, in seven hours, they created something that they used as, you know, kind of a, a North star for the next two years of how the team worked and navigated through a merger. And they were like, that would have taken us weeks before. And we did it in such a short period of time because everyone was, you you know, we'd, we'd done it in small ways, but they were used to working like that together. Somebody's listening and they're going, damn, that's a good idea. Oh my goodness. I got to start <laughs> playing games at work. This is for me. Mm -hmm. But they're a little timid. They're <laughs> a little capacity issues, money issues, blah, blah issues. What are three things they could do just to dip their toe in this world? I mean, there's lots of resources, but I think find like, find a very simple game. I mean, there, there is one called a post up. And so rather than having open discussion, you say, take two minutes, take three minutes, take however long you want. Um, write all your thoughts as individuals on a sticky note or on a, you know, virtual sticky note and put them on the board. So now, rather than having this kind of group think of a open conversation, in the same amount of time, you get people to take a few minutes and write it down. And then you ask them to share with the group, depending on how big the group is, you might split people into smaller groups. But now every person has spoken. So you've right from the get go of that meeting, you've set a new tone. This is a meeting where everyone talks. This is a meeting where everyone has a voice. And so they put the post up. Now you might say, you know, there's another game where you, it's something called an affinity map. So you break people into larger groups, but they're not the whole group. 
and they go and work on different parts of the say this this board of sticky notes and you ask them to come up with some themes so it's partially that they are going to come up with some meaningful themes and they're going to feed that back to the collective but it's also has some more of this mary poppins some of the medicine in the sugar <laughs> is that each person is going to know that people are looking at what they have put there. So now their voice matters. Um, you're also putting them into small cross-functional groups. So you're teaching them that not only does their voice matter on the board, but they're a part of the end decision. So now they're engaged. They've been woven into the process rather than just being talked at or talked over. Um, so you're creating a new dynamic while you're still getting the same kind of outcome. So at the end of it, maybe you have a couple of small groups, they share out and you say, okay, great. Wow. Now we have some overarching themes. You might not create anything different than you would have had, you know, the leadership of that team spoken and sort of said, here's what we're thinking. Or the hippo. Everyone will feel a part of it. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes you do, you get some things way out of left field and people are like, whoa, we never thought about that. So glad this came up. Or you see things differently. But I mean, that's a really easy one. Post up, sort, you know, share out, done. That's a game. <laughs> fair, fair. Yeah. So I want to know more, Cody. Where the hell would I go for resources for this? Where's my Google journey? So, I mean, I think a great resource is a place called Liberating Structures. They're going to have these, think of them like game boards. They're going to have some pre find games that you can play that will achieve certain things. The, the same with game storming. That's a wonderful resource. There's hundreds of crowdsource games in there. Really, really great. There's a place called Coda. They offer frameworks that are more in documents. Any of the design thinking, you can pull a lot of those kinds of games. You know, if you look up things like Meeting Canvas, you're going to get game boards. So really, it's, it's about thinking about it uh, differently and starting to think about it. Like, how can we make this more of an experience? rather than like a one-way radio program. I loved your example of going to a meeting and you're basically just watching TV. You're not participating. You're just, it's a show. I wish I could turn it off, but at least I know what it ends. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Versus like when we, when we create that dynamic where it's everyone's got their hands in the clay, now we're saying, hey, we do something different here on this team, in this department, at this organization. Everybody is involved. I mean, that pays dividends. It may not pay dividends today, but down the road, when somebody sees something, they're a little bit more inclined to raise their hand or pull somebody aside and say, you know, I have something I want to tell you. Yeah. Versus thinking like, well, you know, my voice doesn't matter here. So I'll sit back and watch the show. <laughs> I will add all the resources you mentioned into the show notes. So if anybody wants to find them, go to relationships at work.ca. Now we come to the end, Cody, with the final two. The last two questions I ask all of my guests. So let's start there with the first question being, what's the best or worst employee experience you've had? Uh, that, that's a great question. There's so many options to share. Um, I was recently part of a new organization. You know, my first day, they brought in everybody that I might have, and especially during COVID times, this this was a this felt like a such a big gesture. They brought in everyone that I would have sort of maybe uh, interaction with, to, so we could have you know a half an hour introduction. And then you know there was two things that happened in that meeting that really stood out for me. One, one of the more senior members in the meeting made it. You no, know, he said, "You're coming from an external place to our, our organization, and I really want to encourage you that if you see things that you think could be different or could be better." between now and, you know, a year from now, the door is open and I really hope that you'll tell me. So that created, you know, right away a different sense of ownership, but also a sense that I might have experiences to offer. The second thing that happened in that meeting is as we were going around and they were, they were all very, very kind, which is so nice. Somebody was saying, oh, we're so excited to have you as a new member to this organization. You know, we, we, we don't always get people kind of we get people internally, but not necessarily um, from an external place. And one of our goals is to hire smart people. And rather than telling them what to do, have them tell us, you know, what they want to do, what they need to do, what's new. And so I just felt that those two things, I felt really empowered to really show up at the organization and own it in a way that I might have felt a little bit more timid had I not been given such a great invitation. Love that. So very, 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 very much. Love that. Mm -hmm. Last question. You ready for this? 
Sure. Sound ready. You sound ready, Cody. What, I'm ready. <laughs> what's one simple action people can do right now to improve their relationships at work? Have an agenda for every meeting. <laughs> and when I say an agenda, not just like, here's the 20 million things that we're hoping to fly through, but like, it's like, what is the one thing? If if the fire alarm goes off and the building burns down, what is the one thing this meeting needs to accomplish? If everybody comes into a meeting knowing that, it improves the quality of every person at the meeting, but it also improves the meeting itself. Boom. Boom. <laughs> Let's end with the truth bomb. Thank you so much, Cody, for your time. Always love talking to you on a podcast or not. So thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. Did you just put food in your mouth to finish this off? Perfect. I'm sorry. From I didn't know you were over. I didn't realize there was going to be like a thing. Oh, I'm keeping this in now. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, do it again. Do it again. No, that's it. We're good. Peace out. We're done. <laughs> I'm keeping it. I'm totally keeping it. <laughs> Fuck yeah, I am. And with that, another episode of the Relationships at Work podcast comes to a close. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you uh, got a few takeaways. Of course, all this information can be found at relationshipsatwork.ca, which is on my website. Also, I want to flag something for you if you kind of like what we're doing here. Go to RAW, R at W, it stands for Relationships at Work, Weekly Notes. It's on my website on the top right. And that's where I'm actually going to be starting to do a brief little newsletter. Something that I've thought about, some scenarios, real life situations that could make you think a little differently. Not something that is maybe needing to be as fleshed out as, say, a podcast or a blog post, but something that might, you know, interest you as you start your work week. Eh? Interest peaked. Lovely. Just head on over to russellolliker.com and go to Raw Weekly Notes and sign up. And that should be coming soon if it isn't already in your inbox. How's that for service? All right. Take care of yourself. Always a pleasure. And uh, yeah, we'll speak again. Mm -hmm.